Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. Once part of the ATA tribe, you'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Well, we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one, Greg Ficino. Greg is Curator of Applied Animal Welfare at San Diego Zoo Global in California. He studied Biological Anthropology at UC Davis, where focusing on non-human primate husbandry, behavior, welfare, and socialization. Previously, Greg held positions as an Animal Resources Supervisor at the Californian National Primate Research Center. Animal Care Supervisor of Primates for the San Diego Zoo, and in term curator Elaine Zoo UAE, United Arab Emirates. Greg focuses on integrated management strategies in which all animals receive the benefit of every speciality at each facility. By emphasizing the frequency and diversity of behavior, he and his teams have worked on developing integrated management strategies that exploit the adaptive relevance of behavior and making a behavior meaningful for managed populations. This strategy is designed to be applicable to all species, both captive and wild, and he has extensive experience in the Middle East and East Africa applying these concepts concepts to in situ conservation programs and rehab slash re-release sites. Greg has continued to work towards his institute's mission of ending extinction and has staunchly stood by the idea that all animals should be given an opportunity to thrive. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Greg to the show today, who is patiently waiting. Bye, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing good, buddy. And thank you for the intro. That was very nice and thorough. Appreciate that. My absolute pleasure. And a big thank you to Nikki Boyd, who I believe uh, is potentially in an office somewhere close by to you, who's been a past podcast guest and introduced us. And you've just got back from Kenya, you're telling me. Yeah, yeah. So just did about 10 days on the ground there. Um, We have some pretty extensive conservation programs and partnerships in Kenya right now. Um, We've been working specifically with the Kenya Wildlife Service. They have a um, they have a unique situation in Kenya where pretty much all wildlife, whether it's in private hands, whether it's wild, whether it's captively managed, whether it's rehab, release, pre-release, any of that, all of those animals are the responsibility of Kenya Wildlife Service. So despite the fact that you may be a private rancher that has a you know consortium or a conservation space, um, you still look to Kenya Wildlife Service for guidance. So for years, we worked with a handful of different NGOs out there doing some conservation work. And you really find yourself kind of disorganized. You kind of get halfway done with one and halfway done with the other. And you never really have a clear focus of what you're doing. So over the past few years, we've really developed this relationship with Kenya Wildlife Service. And it's been monumental because it actually gives you the ability to have an impact on all of those species in all of those regions. And and you learn from each of the different regions what works in Mombasa does not work in in Lake Kipia and and vice versa. So we've um, 
we focused a lot on capacity building with the Kenya Wildlife Service as of late. Um, so that's what I was doing was we were, we were actually teaching a course on opportunities to thrive. Um, we did a workshop and the first of its kind, I was told, where we had 15 different captive management facilities uh, from all over Kenya. So that's, again, rescue, rehab, re-release. Uh, they were all in the same room for the first time, 50 folks. And talking about this kind of stuff where it just really wasn't something that was talked about on a large scale. All these guys were into it. They all believe in it. They all wanted it, but they they had never like collaborated with each other on it. So it was, uh, it was really inspirational, to be honest with you, because the workshop just went so well with all the engagement from these folks and kind of how much they embraced everything and, and what they taught us about um, how, how they perceive this, you know, because they see these animals next door, you know, like it's it, to them, you know, there's wild monkeys in their facilities that are coming in and stealing food from the monkeys they're trying to rehab, you know, so, so they have this really fascinating relationship where they can watch this behavior in the wild and watch these problem solving techniques and all this, all this cognitive skill that these wild animals have. And, and they can literally turn around and directly apply that to the way they manage them um, in house and prepping them. So it's, it was really, it was a really cool trip. And obviously it's an amazing country. The people are amazing and the wildlife's amazing. And it's, it's one of the last really few super wild places that I get to spend a lot of time in. So everyone listening, a little bit of an insight into uh, maybe a, uh, an average, not I guess it's not an average day in the life of uh, Greek, but <laughs> some of the <laughs> amazing things that you get to, to do as part of your job description. Uh, and you mentioned in there the opportunities to thrive, which is as you continue to listen to this episode today, uh, something that Greg is going to unpack for us, what he meant when he said that. And, and congratulations on all that, Greg. I mean, getting 50 people in a room in uh, North America is probably be hard enough, let alone yeah, doing agreed, a disorganized place in, in Kenya. Um, so it sounds like you're doing some really important uh, uh, work over there and congratulations and, and thank you uh, on behalf of ATA and, and Planet Earth for <laughs> doing hey, it's my It's my pleasure, buddy. Anytime you need me to go to Kenya, I'm, <laughs> I'm on it. Hey, we gave a, a brief account of uh, some of your experience in your bio just then, Greg, um, but I was hoping we could expand on this some more. So when you think about your current role of Curator of Applied Animal Welfare at San Diego Zoo, ta- taking us all the way back, think about the approximations that led you to this. What, what, where might you say your journey began and, and kind of what, what were some of the important steps on, on doing what you do now, for example, what you just told us about in Kenya? Yeah, it's, you know, it's like the classic romantic story of the little kid who always wanted to do this, right? But um, it was a really long and kind of drawn out and, and curvy journey. So it's, it, I started, I'm from San Diego, and I'm, I'm a local here. And this was my childhood zoo, you know, and I, when I was a kid, this is where I'd come and um, always was really just fascinated by the whole thing. Um, then when I went to Ultimately, when I went away to to university, I started studying biological anthropology, and and I was fascinated with kind of human evolution and behavior, um, which bled immediately into primate evolution and behavior. And UC Davis has a, it's a very unique university. It's a research university first. There's a medical school, a vet school, a law school. Like it's just a massive kind of like intellectual center. So one of the things they had there was this, this primate center that was set up by the National Institutes of Health. And it's, it's designed to study uh, primates as a model for both psychology, neurophysiology, biology. Um, and then you have this huge population that's that's living in this semi-wild state um, that you could do basically really great behavioral research with. So I fell in love with the, the primate behavior and the whole idea of watching their behavior and engaging in how they engage with the environment, how they made this, had this relationship with the environment and their relationships with each other. But of course, you know, it's still managed. So you have to have an understanding of how social groups work because you have to form new groups or split new groups or there's there's big turmoil. And these are rhesus monkeys. So if anybody's ever worked with those uh, monkeys, you know that they're, they're not always the sweetest animals on earth to each other. So you, you have these, these incredible hierarchies and these um, kind of political systems working. <clears throat> and it aligned right with what I was studying. 
So I studied this, this main area was socioecology, where you look at how the ecology drives a social structure, right? So the pressures from the environment are what really has an impact on how that social structure ends up. You know, whether you're a single male group or multi-male, multi-female group, how you manage resources, how big your group is, has a lot to do with how the resources are distributed, how your relationships are has something to do with how resources are distributed. So it was a really kind of deep look into again the relationship between the environment and the individual animal and then how that creates this kind of social structure so i did that for about a dozen years you know after i finished school i stayed on there and um you you know you just ultimately learned a lot about how social groups work in addition to that we have some federal regulations in the us that are pretty staunch about primates and particularly captive primates have to have a supplemental program to address their psychological well-being, which is obviously great, um, but it's it, it's written into federal law. So it's one of those things you you know you can you can go either way. You can meet the bare minimum and be happy with it, or you can really dig deep into it and and find out what makes these animals ticks. And and again, since I'm working with a semi wild population and a population that's um, the indoor population or the smaller groups indoors, more like a zoo population, you can really make the correlation between the two and you can try and elicit the same behaviors in both. So, so it became a mission to, to really understand that better. Um, and working with my colleagues there and, and my partners, um, we, you know, we came up with some really, really great innovative ideas about how we would integrate all that stuff. So then, then the dream comes true and the job pops open in San Diego Zoo and it's the primate supervisor. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what I do already they're going to love me, right? This will be a perfect idea. And uh, came out, got the job. It was it was relatively competitive, but I got the job and um, and we got to work. You know, there was a lot of people into that strategy here. This is an incredibly innovative zoo. They strive for the best in captive management. So we we had some great partners to work with. We 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 made some some really good successes, and that evolved into taking over the enrichment program, um, which evolved into pretty much eliminating the idea. Over the years, we've kind of started to eliminate the idea of an enrichment. It's such an acute um, input based program we've really shifted to this this outcome based program and where we were really focused on the behavioral outcomes that result from the animal's overall experience in our care and that's that's a that's a long term thing it's not the acute you know i give you a puzzle feeder and you play with it for 10 minutes and i check the box that i enriched you it's about again building a relationship between you and your environment. Um, and again, it was embraced here. San Diego Zoo was really keen on it. And um, that opened up a lot of doors and we saw a need uh, to develop a more comprehensive welfare program. And, and again, the foresight of the institution was that this should be a position that has um, a lot of access to, to the whole collection, the whole facility and everywhere. So it was determined that it should have been a curator level position. So, um, which says something about the commitment that the institution has to this. So, so over the course of the 10 years that I've been here, um, kind of bounced through that progression till we ultimately got to this point where we have this applied animal welfare program where we monitor all the welfare of the animals that we that we care for, again, both here and in the field sites, um, at the research facilities, any of the research facilities that we work with, and we monitor them. We develop strategies to, again, give them the opportunities to thrive, which we'll talk about, um, and bring, bring them closer to that relationship with the nat their natural history. Uh, so that that's kind of the long, wavy way that we all ultimately got to this point. And so did you, or were you involved in creating your position? It, it wasn't something that existed, but through uh, the work that you did, the zoo kind of saw a need for it. Yeah, that, that's accurate. It, it didn't exist. And there was a real push in the US. It's, it's, it's getting a lot bigger now, but 
everybody was really fascinated by this idea of welfare and everybody really wanted to, you know, I, I use air quotes, do welfare good. Um, and we, you know, as an institution, we're like, well, this, we have the, the benefit of all this science. We have the benefit of this really long history. We have, we have all these things. We should, we should be the ones that are, that are kind of developing our own welfare program. So, so yeah, the, the position had to be built from the ground up and, and the first, you know, year or two was some growing pains, um, figuring out where where the role was. Um, there was a <laughs> there was a fear that there wouldn't be enough work, uh, which that never turned out to be the case. As you can imagine, there's more than enough work. Uh, so we've the program started to grow a little bit, um, and and you know, I, I get to serve as a mammal curator as well. So so that means I again I have access to all of the different areas, all the managers. We can have dialogue and training and, and again, same kind of capacity building that we do in Kenya. We can do that here. And it gives you a little bit more street cred to be able to get that done. So you mentioned Nikki Boyd earlier. Um, so she's a partner in all these all of these strategies. And she then passes this on to her staff or gives us access to her staff so we can train them in, in some of these uh, newer, innovative approaches. And, and you know, that I tell you, that they are really, everybody really appreciates it because these are things, the things we're talking about aren't things that are really changing the world. They're things that you already know, right? Things that you basically understand about how animals see the world. The, the thing we found is that for the years and years that we've been in animal care professionals, we've been trained away from this. We've been trained to feed in an incredibly efficient manner. We've been trained to clean incredibly thoroughly or to build facilities that can be cleaned easily or build facilities in which we can feed easily. And we, we work on these really tight schedules that are based on our regular daily patterns. So when, when you look at it and you say, well, well, that's that's really just shouldn't be our priority. Our priority should be a very animal centric approach to this. Everybody loves it. People want that, right? You know, that's why people are in this field is because they want to work with animals. They want to see. They want to be fascinated by animals all the time, and they want to uh, provide animals with the ability to be a tiger, you know, or to be a bear or to be an elephant. So that that's kind of the the way it works on the ground here. Yeah. So. You you said there were growing pains there, uh, and I and I can imagine that you know some of them would have been uh, challenges to to overcome in creative ways, and some of them might have led to some frustration along the way. Um, and you mentioned that we've been, you know, we we are being trained and have been trained to to feed in in efficient manners and to clean in efficient manners. Uh, I feel there's lots of people listening to this podcast, and, and I've been in that position myself, uh, where you're you're in an organisation and you potentially view things differently than this efficiency model for us, for our schedules, um, and you want to make those changes similar to the ones that you've just described to us. <laughs> you know, you might be in a small, small zoo or a big zoo, uh, and you want you want to kind of push ideas like the ones that you've, you've suggested that you've pushed in your career. So I'm curious at, w at what drives you. So you're, you're young Greg Ficino. You're <laughs> beating out the competition. You're looking after primate. Uh, you're, in, you're in charge of the care of primates in, in your organization uh, and, and if you see something that maybe uh, if you feel that this isn't a correct way of framing it doesn't sit right with you or um, it's not, not even that that you know that can be built on like where does your mind go with that how, do, how does your mind tackle that challenge uh, to, to and, and you are living proof of you know making the differences that you are now and creating this role how did your mind navigate that because it's not an easy yep. thing to do. Yeah, it's not easy. And <laughs> it's an evolution. And I'm I'm kind of glad you asked because I, I get to be a little bit self-deprecating to so that people understand that, you know, like it, you, you had to evolve, right? So the first first attitude is that you when you get into a position like that is like, I'm the boss, man. Like I said this is the way it needs to go. I don't like your style. I don't like your techniques. You don't know, change it. Do it my way. And as anybody can imagine, everybody's had bosses like that. And maybe some of you were bosses like that. It doesn't work. You know, it's, it, it gets you nowhere. So we, we really had to build up. And I felt like over time, I had to build up this, this sincerity. And what I mean is, it, it's not that I wasn't insincere, but I had to build up this reputation 
as someone who was focused solely on the relationship that the animal has with its environment. And, and you do that by being incredibly consistent and then always being objective and honest. And that is probably what took the most time was, was stepping out of yourself and realizing that, you know, I, I had a, I have a mentor, Dr. Don Jansen, who always told me this, he, and, and he, he teaches this, this class about how influence is way more important than authority. And that's something that you find in the animal care business all the time is that caretakers feel like they don't have a voice. Um, that, you know, there's bigger picture things that are happening that have a direct impact on their life or their ability to care for their animals. And, and so they, they just kind of take those and they get upset at them and they, they feel like they don't have a voice. They don't have any, any way. And they feel like if they were in charge, if I was in charge, I'd fix this. And the reality is, is that doesn't work work that way, right? Because with authority comes a ton of responsibility too. And it's human nature for us to always want to make each other's decisions. You know, my staff always wants to make my decisions for me and I want to make theirs for them. You know, I, it's, it's our nature. So we've had to, you have to evolve that, that thought process and you have to evolve your, your attitude over time and, and make sure that you're always being honest and sincere about what your goals are. And that, that it sounds kind of silly. It sounds a little corny and, and it doesn't, it's not an immediate gratitude. It doesn't automatically uh, win. So I, I started with this outreach program where what we would do is I would do once a month, I would do what we call labs in the, when I was working with the primate group here. And it was, uh, we'd send out a, a journal article about something relevant to primate social, social behavior or primate management or something like that, like a journal club. <clears throat> and I'd schedule a half hour meeting in the team room and we'd come and we'd discuss the article. And I'll tell you the first... I have 15 of those labs that I conducted. I sat there by myself and nobody showed. Sometimes the staff would come in or someone would come in, a keeper would come in, they'd sit down and they'd eat their lunch, you know, or they'd, they'd, they'd you know, get on the computer, but nobody came to the labs. And I remember somebody asked me, they said, don't you feel like a fool doing this every month and nobody shows up and nobody cares and nobody's interested? And I said, no, I don't feel like a fool. I, I'm, it's going to happen. You know, eventually people are going to realize that I want to talk about these things. I want to talk about how to improve the care that we're providing. And I'm also the guy that can remove the roadblocks that are preventing you from doing that. And that was a real breakthrough was that, you know, you can't come into these places and say, well, we can't do this because the boss says, or you can't do this because the boss says, well, I'm the boss. I can stop saying that, or I can fix that, or I can remove that. I can take that roadblock away. So again, that, that didn't happen right away. Well, you know, it, it, we evolved over time to have to ultimately having these really open discussions. And even now we use the same technique. Now when we work with, with different work units, we make sure that we have the leadership team in the room and we assign everybody a responsibility. And we say, these are, we, you need clear roles and responsibilities if you want to move forward. And, and the keepers, you guys are driving this whole routine or the caretakers, you're driving this mission. And bosses, your job is to make sure we don't break any laws and to remove roadblocks. To when someone says, no, we can't feed whole prey items to the tigers because uh, nutrition says we can't. Well, it's the boss's job to go negotiate that and find a way to fund it or find a way to convince the nutritionist that it's the appropriate thing to do. You know, we make those very clear sets of roles and responsibilities. We say, you're an influencer, you're a decider. Um, a lot of this you know, human psychology and hu human dynamic stuff came into it, but we, you, have to, you have to learn that. Most people learn it the hard way, like I did, where you, know, you, go, you wait around for a couple of years, uh, being the tough guy and demand Ending, that people do things your way and you, ultimately you learn that that never works you know you have to you have to take people on the journey with you well, I feel like we could do a whole podcast episode just on this topic <laughs> um, but we will move on I'm, I'm curious just to unpick your, your current title a little bit I mean I'm, I'm guessing the answer is the obvious <laughs> but why, why did you choose the title Applied Animal Welfare so we 
we kind of talk about that a lot because we wanted to make sure that there was action associated with the, the position. And by action, I mean apply, right? So if if we do an assessment, we, we have this systematic way of assessing welfare based on evidence. Um, and then from that, we develop strategies to move the needle on whatever that assessment said. So if that assessment says, you don't eat food in a manner that matches your natural history. Well, we have a handful of techniques to match natural history with the appropriate food item and the appropriate feeding strategy and spatial and temporal feeding modalities over time um, that then we can then apply that to that animal, remeasure and say, well, look, we moved the needle. And, and sometimes we move it a big jump. Sometimes it's just a little jump. But but yeah, it is, it's pretty obvious. Um, that's what the applied thing is. But we wanted to make sure that there was always going to be action associated with it. There's always going to be a set of tools that we can apply. There's always going to be new tools that we develop. We're always going to be actively applying whatever we find out from the scientific community as a whole and from our own population and our own staff. We want to make sure that there's a direct connection. I've seen this in other zoos where the welfare uh, scientist or the head of the welfare program is is a scientist and they, they work in this unit that's a separate kind of research unit from the animal care team. And for a lot of places that would work, you know, I think in small zoos, it probably works. And in some really big zoos where people are used to things being compartmentalized, it works. But for us, it would never work here. You know, I, ha I have to be on the ground. I have to be, I have to have relationships with all the caretakers. I, I do, you know, I mean, and I appreciate what they do. And I need to be a part of their daily routine. I need to be accessible as a member of their department. So we've been really staunch about making sure that despite the fact that we're doing animal welfare science, we are in the animal care program. And, and we, you know, I answer to the same director that every other curator does. Um, Nikki and I have the same boss, right? We do vastly different things, but we have the exact same boss. And that's, that's been really, really key for us. And I think that's why we've been able to apply things with such a small, there's a very small latency between an innovation and its execution. That's exciting. You're, yeah. you're, you're in the trenches, one might say. So then yeah. what, what, is, what does our average week look like for you? Like what You get to work and you don't go to your office, you're out in the trenches with the, the keepers and... We were in meetings but, all day. Well, you, you're 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 identifying the ideal week. <laughs> now, the average week typically doesn't go like that. No, the there's a you know there's a there's a lot of meetings, right? And there's a lot of there's a lot of development of these tools, which includes a lot of research, right? So, um, but we we never lose sight. The the person I work most closely with is our our other animal welfare specialist here, Jessica Sheftel, who's who's just a full blown genius, which helps. But she and I have this very staunch attitude towards you have to be on grounds looking at the collection. You cannot, you can't lose sight of the fact that this is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Um, this is one of the most beautiful facilities. Both of our facilities are just gorgeous and there's amazing, amazing animals out there and you have got to be out there feeling it. So we spend, we try and spend about half of the day out of the office, but of course, you know, it's a big organization and, and at a senior management level, you end up being in meetings about <laughs> nighttime events or how uh, how how marketing is setting up the new thing, um, but we work really closely with. As of late, we've been working really closely with the architects, um, which is a really nice thing, right? So when you're developing new exhibits or whole new areas of the zoo, and it's a hundred and three year old zoo, so we're always developing something. It's nice to be on the ground floor of that and have a really close relationship with that, and. We found that through a lot of our training and capacity building, we focus on everybody. So in our regular evidence-based animal welfare short course that we conduct here four times a year, you in the room, you have the HR directors, you have the marketing team, the PR team, the veterinarians, the animal caretakers, the construction and maintenance guys, the buildings and grounds folks, um, and architects. We, we, we mix the whole group together because animal welfare at this instance 
institution is is not the sole responsibility of animal care team. So so that takes a little bit of coordination, and then that's where I end up sitting in front of a screen a little bit more than I'd like to, um, which is why I really appreciate the field so much, uh, and and get out as as often as I can. My my wife doesn't appreciate that that much, but um, that's kind of my 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 rescue. Sounds familiar. Hey, <laughs> thanks so much for sharing everything so far. I, I, we we call that part of the episode, People's Behavioral Odysseys. So we really <laughs> uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. Move forward, though. We've mentioned it already. I'd like to talk about this thing called the five opportunities to thrive model. Can you tell the listeners of the show what this is? Yeah, it's our what we've established as our guiding principles for the animal welfare program. And that's evolved a little bit to become the guiding principles of our entire husbandry program. Uh, and that, and again, like I said, it covers both the two zoos, our field sites, and our research sites. And it, it was really born of a like any innovation, right? It was it was born out of necessity. When we first talked about developing this new animal welfare program, and like like you said earlier, you know, we had to kind of invent it from from scratch. We you look around at okay, what are guiding principles of animal welfare? And the, and the most common one at the time, this was before the five domains was established in <clears throat> over in Australia, which is also a really beautiful model. Um, the the basic one was the five freedoms that that came out of the you know the Bramble Committee in the UK in the 60s, and it was the it was the foundation that I learned when I first got into animal care was you know the freedom from fear and distress, the freedom from hunger, the freedom to you know express normal behavior, uh, freedom from from again pain. You know it, they were they they've, they've lived in the basics of animal care for the 60 some odd years. And yet, if you really dig into them, I, I found some serious problems with it. One, they're, they're incredibly vague, right? Which is why they're applicable to farm animals, laboratory animals, zoo animals, sanctuary animals. Why, that's the benefit of why they've lived so long is because they're incredibly vague. They're very general, but the word freedom is where I really got hung up. And it's the idea that if I'm freeing you from something, I'm this magnanimous thing that's freeing you from pain. Well, I must have done something to cause that pain, right? That's the way I I, I saw it. And, and it, it puts us in the wrong mindset because it's really about uh, eliminating negative indicators of welfare. It's not, it has nothing to do with promoting positive indicators of welfare. So to me, it was, we were looking at it backwards. I felt like it was a really backwards way to go. It's like, okay, so we're just essentially trying to prevent cruelty, which isn't good enough. That's not good enough for, if we're going to build a new program, it, it's got to be about promoting positive indicators of welfare. So I, I remember when we developed the opportunities to thrive, it was with a colleague of mine, Dr. Lance Miller, who's now at um, Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. Chicago. And, and he was a researcher here at the at the zoo. We were working together on developing the, the guiding principles for the welfare program. And he's a, another, he's a brilliant scientist and, and he has this almost encyclopedic knowledge of the literature. <clears throat> so we talked about well, you know, the freedoms are no good. The freedoms suck for us because it's these negative indicators. What are these positive indicators? Let's look at the first one. You know, when it comes to uh, the freedom from hunger, it's like, well, animals can be hungry. There's nothing wrong with that. What, let's look at the, let's dig deeper into what feeding is all about for animals. Every single, if you look at almost every adaptation <clears throat> that makes an animal a specialist or, or, or makes a tiger a tiger <clears throat> is designed for sensing if there's food around, finding that food without being spotted, chasing that food down and attacking it and killing it and eating it. You know, it doesn't have giant forearms because that's cool. It has those so it can take down deer. It doesn't have retractable claws because it's convenient. It has those to, you know, to, to shred things, to hold onto things. The carnassial teeth, the huge jaw muscles, everything, the, the can, down to the camouflage, right? Down to the tiger's stripes and the color of its pelt. All of that is associated with knowing about, finding, acquiring, and processing food. So, why do we feed it ground meat in a stainless steel bowl? Like it just, 
it, it just stuck in my head and I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap around it. I couldn't get it. And then Lance says, well, you know, look at all this literature that indicates that when you feed tigers, uh, I'm using tigers as an example because it was the easiest one. When you feed tigers in a way that matches their natural history, it improves their welfare and it's in, in validated ways, right? So their behavior changes. You see less stereotypic behavior. So, and, and with stereotypic behavior, whether we whether we think stereotypic behavior is bad or not, or we think it's driven by boredom, what, whatever you want to argue that, I, I don't care. The point is, it's a it's a section of their behavioral repertoire that's being dedicated to a behavior that is not helping the tiger be a tiger, right? So if we if we eliminate stereotypic behavior, that 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 gap in its behavioral repertoire gets backfilled with a with a tiger behavior, um, you know, a behavior that's meaningful to the animal. So it's not just it's not just removing the stereotypic behavior because that's the removal of a negative indicator of welfare potentially, but it's actually adding in some more complex behaviors that are appropriate to a tiger. So people have done this. There's tons of literature to say that, you know, when when tigers eat um, whole prey items, their teeth are better, their their musculature is better, they're, they're, they don't get arthritis as, as quickly, uh, their organs are healthier, their behavior is more appropriate, they, they actually engage in things at a higher level. People studied that, validated it, and there's a list of literature for it. So that was kind of the genesis of the opportunities to thrive was to improve on the on the five freedoms, get away from the negative indicators and start rattling off these validated positive indicators of welfare. And that, that's really what drove it. I mean, that, that, it was that one afternoon in, uh, in my office with Lance where we, we decided that it wasn't good enough and, we, and we, wanted to, we wanted to rewrite that. And so, when when was this? Put it on the time frame. Was this yesterday? Was it five years ago? <laughs> when was it? I, I'm pretty well versed at it for something that happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> it, it was uh, 2012, believe it or not. So 2012, and I, and I remember we we brought it to to your side of the world in 2015 um, at a conference in in Australia up north in Cairns, and it was the that was the one of the first times that I heard from uh, David Meller and started to hear about the the five domains and and we never we met before and um, my my colleague Jessica has met with him and spent some time with him here and it's it's really funny we we never looked at it as like competing guiding principles we never I, I didn't perceive it I don't perceive those as as a as a competing guiding principle I don't think that you have to choose one or the other I think they're both do what they're supposed to do which is drive the discussion make you think about it right make you force you to ask those questions is this tiger eating the way a tiger should eat and of course this we run into this all the time and, and I know that Meller probably has as well that you know, well, it's a zoo. We can't, it's not going to chase down a deer and kill it in front of a bunch of, you know, kids that are paid to come to the zoo. We can't do that. And that's where we really, that's where the discussion is most important because if you got, you're, you're, you're a trainer, you're a behaviorist, you understand this, right? You understand that behavior has components. It makes sense to you. So when I look at hunting behavior, I don't see it as a behavior hunting. I see it as a tiny little components using your sensory modalities to determine that there's a choice you need to make, right? That's the first part of hunting, either smelling it, seeing it, or hearing it. So using one of your sensory modalities to understand that you need to make a decision and you need to make a choice. Making the choice to do something about it is another component of that behavior. The next one is the, the, the physically demanding component, right? So the, that beautiful balance between brain and brawn. Like if you ever watch a tiger stalking, you know, it's this, you see these just rippling muscles and the patience and all the senses are alert, right? They're making sure they're not stepping on a twig and they're walking slowly and they're, they're, they have to determine which way the wind is going and all that. That's an incredibly complicated cognitive and physical suite of things happening together, right? So, but, but that's a chunk of the behavior. Then there's the physically demanding part of the actual chase and kill. 
And again, that another, another really nice relationship between brains and brawn. And then there's the processing of the food. So, which is, you know, tearing and pulling and uh, taking fur off and processing bones and maybe even stashing it, right, for a couple of days or hiding it from a competitor or hiding it from another predator. So those, those six some odd little behavioral chunks are all possible with, a, with an effective management strategy in a zoo without having to have that animal chase down, attack and kill a live prey item. You know, we can we can replicate the, the both the motivation again, you know, sticking to, to training, but the motivation, the cues and the rewards associated with all of those pieces of actually hunting. And, and you mentioned there that whatever model you're using, they, they both do what they're supposed to do, which, or maybe there's another model out there you discuss, uh, David Mallow's one, um, is to drive the discussions and ultimately, of course, uh, improve animal welfare. Um, can you, so we talked about going backwards just a little bit, an older model or, or a model that some people might still use, uh, freedom from hunger and kind of all the components of that that add opportunities for animals so is, does that make other five freedoms sorry the five opportunities to thrive are they kind of parallel with the five freedoms did you take opportunity to be free from hunger and kind of then develop opportunities to add stuff to animals and then go to the next freedom like did you use it as a as a base to formulate your your ideas you know it's it's an interesting question i and i think i think david would say the same thing I, it's not intentional. I think the five freedom or the five freedoms were so ingrained in us as we studied biology, as we studied this stuff growing up, uh, that you can't help but think of it in those terms. I, you know, everybody who comes up with a with a replica or something to replace five freedoms, if you ever pay attention, there's still only five. Like everybody always ends up on five, and I, I think it's because those are the you know the, those are the the five basic the five domains the five opportunities the five freedoms. Those are the five basic things that we think about, right? So food, nourishment, the ability to maintain your own physical capacities, the the you know, the need for optimal health, the need to express behavior that's an appropriate way and the ability to make choices. So I don't, I wouldn't say that we sat there. I did. I know we didn't sit there and go, okay, you know, freedom from hunger. How do we improve that one? Freedom from pain. How do we improve that one? It, it just happened kind of organically. And, and they, those were the five areas that we, that we focused on. Then to be honest, when we sat there that day and wrote these out and really hashed it out and argued it and, and went through what, what made sense, that was the, the last we spoke of the five freedoms was, was the beginning of the conversation where we said, this isn't satisfying. This isn't good enough. And we didn't, we didn't sit there with them as a model, but, but I think that that's, that's why they worked the first time. That's why they've lasted so long is because it fits in our head. It makes sense to us because we want, we want a finite number of things we have to worry about. We always do, right? We don't want an infinite number of things we have to stress out about. We don't want to have an infinite number of, of basic building blocks of something. And, and like, you know, like you mentioned, this is, you could use either one of them. It's to describe the discussion because there's a, there's a balance between art and science here. And everything has to be based in science because that's where we have the validations. That's where we have, you know, it's past muster, right? It's gotten to where we can say this is, this is as dang close to a fact as we can get it. But there's an art to executing that science. You know, I always say this in, in my house. My, my wife does all the, she bakes a lot. And I can't bake to save my life. And it's because it's it's a science. It's it's chemistry, right? You have to follow a recipe. You have to have this much flour and this much butter and this much this, or else it's gonna it's not gonna work. It'll come out wrong. Um, so she does all the baking because she can follow those rules precisely, and she follows the science. She does the science in our house when it comes to nourishment. I do the art. I do all the cooking. 
So, you know, with cooking, it's you can you can change the way the recipe's written. It doesn't matter if you use this much oregano or this much oregano. It's still going to work. You know, it's still it's to get you you have this kind of uh, you, you can you can make this melange of different flavors because of the art. So, that's how we look at welfare is that I say, okay, here's the science behind what an animal needs to thrive. Now let's get down to work and do the artwork. Let's build the palette. Let's let's paint the picture for this animal. We're talking about things in terms of an overall life experience now, like a storyboard, right? So how does this animal's life arc and ebb and flow and how does its life change after it rains? How does this life change after a forest fire? How, do we, how does its life change after a, a hot spell or the loss of a longtime partner or the introduction to a new partner? You know, those are, those are all experiences that these animals have. Our goal is to give them the tools that they need to deal with those experiences and turn those experiences into something meaningful for them. It's not, again, it's not that acute episode of here's a puzzle feeder you know you spent 10 minutes on it that's better than the way you ate before because it only took you five minutes to eat before i don't have anything against that i'm just saying those those are part of a larger experience that an animal is having and and if we if we have these guiding principles the domains the opportunities whatever it triggers that that discussion and the discussion is where the art comes in from, from what I've seen, you know, and certainly how we apply it. That's how it's worked for us. Well, I can't bake to save my life either. So that makes two of us. <laughs> the, so can, can you specifically, I think you started to kind of unpack them for us, their physical capacities, express behavior, the ability to make choices. Can you specifically go through, if, if we were to go look at a, a diagram that you put together um, or, or read an article that you wrote about this, what are the specific five opportunities to thrive? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. So the first one is, is the opportunity for a thoughtfully presented, well-balanced diet. And this is it's probably the simplest one because this is what we this is the first question we always ask whenever you whenever you assess an, an animal whether it's in a, a, you know whether it's a domestic animal or a wild animal or anything like that right so we, we already talked about how all these physical adaptations are associated with with finding and processing food but but it's not just what you eat and and we have we have a huge benefit in the zoo world now and even in the sanctuary world that we have have access to really high quality food. And it's kind of a blessing and a curse because if you look at, you know, I work with wild elephants as well as captive elephants. And what wild elephants eat is absolute garbage compared to what we feed them. You know, we feed them these rich haze and these wonderful concentrated pellets and all that stuff. And, you know, these elephants up in Northern Kenya, they're eating wood, you know, bark, like dead trees. That's that's their diet. So we, we all have this this really open access to really healthy, nutritious food for the animals we care for. So I don't focus so much on that because I feel like we, we, can, we can access that, right? That's something that's really accessible. But it's about thoughtful presentation. It's about looking at how long an animal spends feeding. How many, how, how, what, what percentage of that behavioral repertoire or that activity budget or that daily routine is associated with finding food and then processing that food. And, you know, that's what that opportunity is about. So it's a, it's a, we ask a series of, of different uh, outcome based questions about that opportunity. So we say, is the animal have a healthy weight, right? That's directly related to the nutrition. We say, does the animal uh, acquire food in a way that matches its natural history or that's similar to its natural history? Just like the, just the description of hunting I gave earlier for a tiger. Does the animal process food? Meaning, does it chew it? Actually, you know, the actual processing of the food, is it is it wolfing it down, you know, like our, like our pet dogs do? Or is it, you know, actually, you know, tearing it apart appropriately? Um, does it spend the appropriate amount of time time eating that matches, you know, the amount of time that would match its natural history. 
And, you know, those are the outcomes that we're looking for. And so that's the discussion part, right? That's the beauty of it. We have science to validate each one of those outcomes as something that has a positive impact on welfare. Um, you know, from, from the healthy weight to the amount of time you spend engaged in feeding behaviors. There's, there's a million different articles showing you that these have positive impact on, on welfare. So the, the, the trick is to understand the opportunity and then ask those questions, right? And then, and then move forward with how are we going to how are we going to develop a strategy that allows them to meet this the next one is the opportunity to self-maintain and this one's a little bit trickier for people to really grasp right off the bat but we we touched on it earlier that animals have this incredible relationship with the natural world and there there's something really kind of magical about that when you when you look at it so you, if you look at animals one of the most obvious dramatic ones is, is bears um, North American bears so grizzly bears right as soon as the day length the photo period changes starts to change even before the temperature changes before the as a photo period starts to change that animal's behavioral repertoire changes not only does it behaviorally change it physically starts to change right so food that's consumed and energy that's coming in is, is turned into fat in a different way. Their fur gets thicker, right? If, if you even look at this with, with domestic animals, um, you know, goats, as the days get shorter and winter is on the way, these animals physically change. So, I mean, just think about how kind of cool that is, that you that you can have this relationship with the, the universe, essentially, right? Or the way the earth operates changes your physiology. So, so we ask questions about, are we giving animals the ability to self-maintain? You know, we do hoof trims on, you know, captive hoof stock all the time. Or zoo, zoo house hoof stock, you have to do hoof trims all the time. Wild goats and sheep don't need their hooves trimmed. You know, are we providing appropriate structure and substrate you know any of your any of your listeners who work with raptors or work with birds right you know a lot of time and energy goes into making sure the perching is appropriate so that they have good foot health good joint health um, anybody who's working with birds who can't fly right how do you maintain that physical capacity right um, so that's what the opportunity to self-maintain is about not cheating these animals out of the ability to make decisions that make them healthy. I live in San Diego, right? We've talked about it. And for those of you who've never been here, um, we, I, I don't, I'm totally comfortable saying this. We have the most beautiful weather on earth. All right. It's, it's, it's sorry. It's, it's perfect year round always. So we get really soft, right? Cause we don't have super hot summers. We don't have super cold winters. I mean, really when it gets a little bit below our regular average, you know, people are walking around with jackets and scarves and it's, it's, it's funny to see people from real temperate regions come in and say, what they're in shorts and t-shirts and we're wearing jackets. So we, we, reflect on our we we project sorry on our animals so as soon as it gets below a, a certain temperature here and we're talking a very small band we put up heat lamps we got they got it they're going to be freezing we got to we got to make sure they've got heat lamps up and this and that when when i worked in davis with the monkeys we just fed them more right <laughs> because that's that's what you do as the day gets shorter it's about to get winter you eat more food so you can put on fat and build this thicker fur coat and be prepared for the winter so i i feel like a lot of our strategies this is where we want people to think do the animals have the ability to move um, and make choices to improve their self-maintenance? Do they have the right substrate and structure to maintain skin, feathers, scale, all of those things? And, and are they executing the behaviors that are associated, associated with that actual application, right? So it's not, it's not just dust bathing, it's effectively dust bathing, bathing. Are they doing it right? Do they have the right substrate for that? So we ask, those are the outcomes we ask for that one, right? Is the, is the animal's overall ability to safe maintain, are we interfering with it? Are we adding chemicals to the environment? Are we adding cleaners to the environment? Are we adding, are we removing things from the environment that are pretending, preventing these animals from self-maintaining? We, we drove this one strangely for a little bit of analogy was these spider monkeys that we had in the children's zoo years ago. And they had this exhibit that you couldn't even walk in. There was so much perching. 
I mean, it was just perched like it was this labyrinth. And and your first instinct is, wow, that that's really thoughtful. You know, there's a lot of stuff for those monkeys to, to walk on. Then you sit and you watch these monkeys. They never use their tails. And they have the prehensile tail, right? So they, they basically have that fifth limb that allows them to negotiate those things. They never, never w- navigated these perches like a normal spider monkey would. And they were weak. They couldn't do it. They physically didn't have the muscles to do it. We deprived them of their opportunity to self-maintain because we, were, we, we put them in a situation where they couldn't execute a behavior that was natural, that was designed to keep them physically fit. Soon as we pull this, you know, it's like pull out. 80% of that perching, you know, 85% of that perching. And we did. And all of a sudden you start seeing the suspensory behavior. You start seeing they're not good at it. They had to practice and get better at it. But it was like a whole chunk of their life was, was missing. And our intention was to help them by putting in all that perching. So that's self-maintenance is one of those ones we really want people to think about. The, the next one is the opportunity for optimal health. And that's related to like the rapid diagnosis and treatment of disease, um, the benefit of advanced technology. But the key, key factor in this one is it's the only one that's not animal centric. It's the one that's more human centric. The, the opportunity for optimal health we've found when we look at the research the primary reason why if you have if you have a really great medicine program, you have all of the best technology, you have the smartest vets, you have uh, all of the access to all that stuff, and yet you still have animals that don't have optimal health, that always points to the same thing, and it's communication. It's leadership and it's roles and responsibilities. Do you understand who's got the appropriate role and the appropriate responsibility for treating an animal. In the U.S., we do this a lot. Veterinarians are are the only people, if you look at a zoo, they're the only people that are licensed to do their job. But I don't have a curator's license. Like I wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't have to go to curator school. They they went to vet school, right? And they have they say an oath. Um, they're committed. They have got to fix problems with animals. That's what they do. So what happens is their their role in the organization sometimes get, can, gets confused, and they're not just a medical professional. They start to become decision makers on management issues because because we we respect them, right? And we know that they're going. If we put a problem in front of a veterinarian they're going to solve it. I'm making sweeping generalizations about veterinarians. So to all my veterinarian friends out there, I love you very much. I'm only doing this to make a point, but they're, they, they're going to solve a problem for you. So as an animal manager dealing with an animal that has a broken leg, the vet's going to tell you, well, okay, you know, we'll, we'll cast it up, but they have to be off of it. And they, they have to be isolated from their peers and they have to be in this room for, for this amount of time for it to heal. And you'll have the manager look at them and go, okay, that's the only, okay, that's fine. That's, there's no options. No, there's plenty of options. And, and it's a relation to collaboration. The, the veterinarian is there to tell you medically what needs to be done. And the manager's role is to figure out how to get that done without impacting the animal's you know, social experience or spatial experience or any of those things. And you can't do that unless you have that honest conversation with each other. And you say, this is my role, this is your role. And the, again, the, this is best described by an analogy uh, where we had an emergency case at night or what could have been an emergency case at night. I called the on-call vet and, and there was a history with these animals of having obstructions. And I thought maybe this one might have been having one. And she says, well, do you want me to come in and work it up or not? And I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And she goes, well, I can tell you one thing we're not going to do. We're not going to second guess each other. And all of a sudden, all the pressure of the decision making was relieved because she made it clear that no matter what I decided and no matter what she decided, we weren't going to hold it against each other. And it's a really ugly part of the animal business is that we all care. We're everything's emotional, right? We usually spend the best days of our lives and the worst days of our lives when it comes to animals with the people we work with. You know, we we have animals that we truly, truly care about die. We have animals that we really, really want the best for, have a wonderful experience or have a baby or something like that. So it's there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of feelings. And so we tend to end up in these categories of you made that decision because you don't care as much as I do. 
and that's, that's catastrophic when it comes to appropriate welfare for animals. When we look at the vast majority of the issues that we have when it comes to animal welfare, they come down to not knowing roles and responsibilities, not knowing who's going to be the advisor, who's going to be the, the decider. So the opportunity for optimal health is, is 50% about, right, is there, is there rapid diagnosis and treatment? Is the treatment efficient, effective? And then we start asking outcome questions about communication. Do you know who's responsible for what part of this animal's care? Is it, is it easy to have those conversations? Do you have access to having those conversations? Um, are you clear as a caretaker who's responsible for what component of this animal's overall experience at our facility? The vast majority, I have to say that, Ryan, like the vast majority of our issues are there and not the um, not the feeding ones. Those are easily fixed, not even self-maintenance ones. It's it's opportunity for optimal health that, that we, we have to work on. Like, like you said earlier, we could do a whole podcast just on having effective communication and relationships between um, animal caretakers. So the, the next one is the opportunity for, um, to express species specific behavior. We touched a little bit on this and you touched on it in the intro that when, we, when I talk about species specific behavior, I'm not saying you need to do the exact same behavior that you would do if you were living in, you know, in the Serengeti. Because not only is that unrealistic, it's potentially unnecessary. We, we measure behavior here in our welfare program based on the frequency and the diversity of behaviors. So are you executing a normal amount of behaviors to get what you want and to avoid things that you don't? And are you executing those behaviors at a frequency that gets what you want and avoids what you don't? So it's a, a great example of a behavior that is uh, really high in frequency and really low in diversity is stereotypic behaviors, right? It's the, it happens a lot and it's not a very diverse behavior. It doesn't change, you know, pacing in a figure eight or, or something along those lines. And it's not, we can't tell if it's getting that animal what it wants or allowing it the ability to avoid something that it doesn't. So it's not a behavior that matches their natural history. So that's what I, that's what I mean when we talk about uh, species specific behavior. Um, and we talk about these, the, the, the idea that the animals are, are cognitively challenged and, and emotionally healthy. And, and emotionally healthy in terms of like this component of welfare is, is a really tricky one for me. It feels a little soft, it's a little fluffy, um, and I have a hard time getting around it. But, but working with trainers and, and understanding, now understanding training so much better, it makes perfect sense to me, right? So... Cognitive health is the ability for an animal to solve a problem that they're facing, right? To, to face a problem and solve it in a way that benefits them. Emotional health is the motivation to do that. That's really the way I've been able to rationalize it in my head is that, it, it you know, having the ability to do it is one thing, but wanting to do it and being motivated to do it, not out of fear, you know, not out of starvation, not out of you know, anything else, but the motivation to, to solve that problem is where I, where I look at an animal as being emotionally healthy. So that's, again, that's what the, that fourth opportunity, the opportunity for species specific behavior is. We ask, you know, are they executing behaviors that are frequency and diversity that match their natural history? Are they able to make, you know, meaningful, are behavior, behaviors meaningful to them? You know, questions like that are, are do they have stereotypic behavior? Um, those are those are all the outcomes or some of the outcomes that we would use to measure. And then the final one is something that I'm, I would suspect a lot of your listeners, um, a lot of people in the in the training field are familiar with, and it's the opportunity for choice and control. And we've found that we use that term. My, my colleague, Jessica Sheftel, always says this. she says we use the term choice and control as if it's one word, choice and control. Like, they, you know, you, you have to have one to have the other and, and, and they always come together. And I think what it is, is that we forget that the ability to have choice or to make a choice is what puts you in control. Right? It puts you in control of your own outcome. So when we talk about choice and control, I know in, in, in the training circles and especially like protected contact or positive reinforcement work with uh, elephants, right? 
the elephant's not restrained in any way. There's no, there's no uh, positive punishment. If, if the elephant chooses to walk away from a, from a training session, so be it. It walks away, right? And we, we look at it and we say, see, she had choice and control. And I, I agree with that to an extent, right? But I think it's actually a much more complicated concept than that. When we Again, we'll go back to this, these experiences that we're talking about. If we talk about that feeding strategy with the tiger, the first thing that happens after the animal senses that there may be a prey item around is it makes a choice whether or not to pursue it. So when we feed our tiger in a zoo, we don't ever put it in that choice situation. We almost never do, right? We don't ever give it a, a, a precursor, <coughs> excuse me, something that matches their, their natural sensory modalities that allows them to make a choice. I smell deer. I'm not really in the mood for deer. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to get up. <clears throat> you know, I mean, that could happen. A tiger could do that, right? I'm full. I'm, I'm not interested in it. So when we dig into the, the choice and control question here, it, it is, again, about making behaviors meaningful, but also making their physiological adaptations meaningful. I mean, how many of our animals in zoos don't need to use their sense of smell for what it was originally built for, right? They don't need to. And, and how many times, because, because your sense of smell is, is a, it's where you get honest signals from the environment. If you smell a deer, there's a deer there. If you don't smell a deer, there's not a deer there. You don't smell a deer and there's not a deer. It's, it's always honest. The barometer changes, it's going to rain. It, the, the earth doesn't lie to you. It tells you the truth. And if you can capture those signals then and learn how to use them to your advantage, that's choice and control. We show up in our uniforms and our keys and the radio, and it means it can mean anything to those animals. You could be walking in to feed them. You could be walking in to shift them. You could walk them in to train them. You could walk them in, or you could be walking in to do a vet procedure, or you could just be walking in because you left your water bottle in the kitchen. You know, it's not that we're never telling the animals the true reason why we're there. So they can't make choices. So they don't have control. The cat has to get up and come to the door and start pacing when it sees you because you might feed it. It doesn't have it doesn't have the it doesn't have a signal that tells it it's okay to make a choice not to get up. So that's where we're at on the on the choice and control. And again, a lot of those outcomes that we measure are do the animals use their sensory modalities to make decisions about the next step in their life? And again, it helps with the you know an analogy uh, here helps with with the when I worked with gorillas, we had the these silverbacks or I'm sorry the this troop that was run by a silverback, and the keeper would split them up in the morning into bedrooms. It would take the silverback out away from the group for for what he called breakfast. And I came in one morning and he's and he I came around the corner to look in the in the at the gorillas and the silverback charges the bars, you know, just goes nuts, freaks out. And I thought, why was this 420 pound silverback gorilla have a problem with me? And I asked the keeper and he says, oh he doesn't like strangers. And I thought, that can't be true. He's no reason to dislike me. This is weird. Well, what I realized was he's separated from his family. He has no choice but to be away from his females. The sole reason why he's you know twice as big as they are is because he's to, to, there to, to defend them, to protect them from other males, right? And to protect his genetic investment in this troop from other things. And we've taken that away from him because we've separated him. So he has no choice. He's not in control. Of course, he's pissed off. Of course, he's going to charge me. Of course, he's going to go crazy. So as soon as we gave him his choice back and said, no more separations for feeding, the girls can can fight with him if they want to. He'll get the food that he needs. They'll get the food that they need. It's, it's gorilla business. It's not our business. As soon as we gave him that choice, he doesn't get up when strangers come in the bedroom anymore. You're lucky if he lifts his head because he's in control. He has the choice. When we, when we took the choice away from him, we automatically removed any control that he had. And it was against his natural history. And that's, you know, that was one of the real, when we, when we started digging into choice and control, that was one of the ones that always stuck out in my head. So that's the that's the five of them from from beginning to end. So sorry if that was a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> we like passion talking on the show. So uh I'm going to answer your sorry with a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they were thoughtfully presented, well-balanced diet, 
the opportunity to self-maintain, opportunity for optimal health, opportunities to express species-specific behaviours and opportunities for choice and control. Uh, I like how you said uh, <laughs> at the end there with that gorilla example that it was a gorilla business. What I'm excited about is this opportunity to learn from you and uh, present this information to the listeners of the show that are zoo professionals, um, but also veterinary professionals, but also those that work with domestic animals. Um, I, I like connecting the dots in my own mind as I listen to you, and I'm sure the listeners of the show are as well. Um, and, and as you said earlier, uh, one outcome is to uh, and have discussion uh, and, and push these things forward. So I think we can all uh, learn and learn from what you're doing, learn from the work that you've done uh, and, and apply it to wherever and we're working, whatever species we're working with, whatever capacity we're working with them in. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, there were a few other things we wanted to talk about today, but looking at the time, uh, because you are one of my new favourite passion talkers of all time, um, we're going to move <laughs> on to the last question. And we started off with uh, you working with the rhesus monkeys uh, in your university, talked a lot about what you do now and and the five opportunities of five model. Just quickly, for this last bit, can you take us into the future now, Greg, uh, and share with us what you really want to see happen over the next five to ten ten years in the animal, we normally say animal training world, but this time uh, we'll go a little bit broader in in the animal welfare world. Yeah, I I think I have a pretty clear vision of what I'd like to see specifically in the next five to ten world, ten, ten years. I would like to see the term animal welfare uh, used for what it is, which is that it is a science. Animal welfare is the the science of measuring, you know, scientifically evaluating measurable outcomes of an animal's condition. I don't want to see it continue to get weaponized. Um, we use it in so many different terms now. We have people who, you know, if you disagree with the with what I'm doing in terms of how I'm managing this animal, you're compromising its welfare, right? People can just throw it out there so easily. And it's such a powerful world that I've, I worry that people don't really grasp the definition. So in the next five years, I'd really like people to understand that this is a science. Animal welfare is a science. We use art to achieve that science. I'd also like to see in this world us being a lot more transparent. I think what happens when people work with uh, managed animals, animals in managed care, there are detractors. There are certainly people that that don't believe animals should be in managed care, and and you know, good on them for that. I, I'm I'm fine with that as um, as their approach to things. But I don't think we should be defensive. I don't think we should say um, you know just whitewash things. I think we should be open and say, yeah, you know what? Sometimes animals in in managed care have stereotypic behavior, and we don't know what the heck it is, and we're working our butt off to figure out what causes it, and we're working our butt off to figure out what alleviates it and we'd love your your contributions to that too you know like we recognize that this is an issue we're not we're not going to hide behind it we're not going to get away from it we know that this is how you save species sorry that's that's also been validated right you know it's that like i work for an institution whose mission is to end man-made extinction I believe in that, and I I watch it happen every day. I saw I saw crows in Hawaii last month that hadn't been in the wild in forty years, hadn't been seen. They were extinct in the wild, and now they're back. California condors, you know, uh, uh, putting these elephants back in the wild up in in northern Kenya. What we do. I know that zoos have conservation value. I, I I've seen it, and we have evidence to suggest it. So. It's important that that zoos exist and continue to contribute to to conservation, but we need to be open about where our shortcomings are. We need to figure out we need to figure out why so many carnivores pace in zoos. We need to work on that. And we need to provide those animals with whatever it is that we're not doing or take away whatever it is that we're doing um, that has an impact on that. So I'd like us to be more transparent than that. I'd like that to be something that we talked about. I'd like us to own the word stereotypic behavior. Those of us in, in, in managed care, we need to own that world, that word. It shouldn't be called zoocosis or whatever they call it on the on the internet. That that's it's a behavior. We study behavior. We understand that inputs create outcomes. It's an outcome. We need to find the input. That's got to be something we need to own. And I, I, that's not, those aren't really sexy. I apologize. Those are both kind of boring, but <laughs> that's, 
I'm trying to be realistic that, you know, in the next five, five, six years, I'd like to see that be the case. Let's make transparency sexy again. Yeah. <laughs> Add to the pool of meaning and, and make sure that we're uh, appreciating that animal warfare is a science uh, and, and, and being con- consequently being careful about how we use that word uh, and, right. and not weaponizing it. Hey, Greg, for anyone listening to the show that might want to learn more, uh, is there any way that you can direct them online, any resources uh, that you can go to maybe? Uh, how, how, how would they go out? Where would they go to learn more about San Diego Zoo? Can you just share that with the listeners of the show? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a quite robust uh, presence on the internet. So San Diego Zoo Global, if you, you type that into any search engine, you're going to get our entire suite of sites. And the the ones that are going to be the most interesting, see so the actual zoo site, the actual safari park site, but the Institute for Conservation Research is probably the most exciting when it comes to the type of stuff that we're doing to um, end extinction, right? So all of our conservation programs are highlighted there. And we've we've applied opportunities to thrive to as many of the conservation programs that we can, but there is a article that came out um, last year and uh, Allison Greger et al. And it's how we apply the opportunities to thrive to an extinct species that was being reintroduced. And so it kind of brings the whole thing together. If you ever wanted to figure out how to put this stuff together in terms of like conservation and animal welfare, it's a, it's a, it's a really good kind of synthesis of all that. Um, so those would, those would be the first two places that I would say you want to look at. Opportunities to, opportunities to Thrive is described in a lot of um, different places. Uh, the new Fowler book about, uh, or the new edition of the Fowler, um, that textbook that everybody has, uh, has a, a relatively good description of it as well. Wonderful. And we will link to all of us in the show notes as well. So uh, I'll get Greg to send me links through after the Recording has finished today to make sure it's in an easily findable location for you to listen to on the Animal Training Academy website. Hey, Greg, this has been so much fun. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience and knowledge with us today from myself and on behalf of everyone listening. And uh, we appreciate you taking time to come and hang out with us here at Animal Training Academy. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That was awesome. Thanks for the invite. I, I really enjoyed chatting with you. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.